from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. A dirty secret in wine country. There is a, a loophole in our trade regulations. Our ongoing look at the pressures facing family farmers growing grapes in California. Some good earnings news from two bellwether stocks, but pressure remains. As many Midwest producers see the potential for big yields this season, others are just looking for a little rain. Now we do see some increasing problems across the high plains. What ranchers are facing right now on Ag Day. Ag Day is brought to you by Pioneer. Ben's Benz, please hold. Yeah, Ben's has been busy all day. Seems like no one can keep up with this new Z series. What did you all put in these seeds? Science. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. While Midwest crops have seen some favorable growing weather, cattle producers are looking for some rains. Right now, nationally, grazing lands are rated just 35% good to excellent. Now here's a look at the latest drought monitor, which shows just over 22% of the country is in drought right now. That's up slightly from last week. And you can see issues are starting to form in the West. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says 32% of the grazing lands overall are now rated poor to very poor. And he says there are several Western states where more than half of their grazing lands are in poor to very poor condition. Approximately 19% of the cattle inventory is in an area dealing with drought. Now we do see some increasing problems across the high plains, extending into parts of the west where it has been rather hot and dry recently. On the flip side, relatively lush conditions continue to grace the Midwest. We have a couple of states, even this late in the summer, still over 70% good to excellent. Washington state hit particularly hard right now, where 65% of the state's pastures are in poor to very poor shape. And there are some areas of drought concern in Nebraska and South Dakota, two states that will be part of next week's Pro Farmer Crop Tour. It all kicks off on Monday. Scouts will survey corn and soybean fields in those two states, along with Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Minnesota, and Ohio. Then each night, crews in the east and the west will meet to talk about what they found. As tour leads, Brian Grady of Pro Farmer and Chip Flory of AgriTalk discuss sample yield estimates for each state. And we'll bring you those numbers each night as part of Crop Tour Live on Farm Journal's social media channels and on agweb.com starting just before 8 o'clock Central Time. The people in Puerto Rico once again dealing with a lack of electricity after Hurricane Ernesto hit the island. The storm dumping heavy rain now making its way to Bermuda. Officials say three major rivers flooded over their banks after more than a foot of rain fell. The island known for having large plantations along with smaller family farms as well as livestock. Its agriculture secretary reporting there was damage caused by flooding in banana and plantain farms. Losses were also expected to coffee and vegetable crops. Meanwhile, chances for severe weather remains over the Midwest. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht joins us with more. Yeah, we do have the chance of a few strong thunderstorms, severe thunderstorms working across the Midwest. The shape is what's pretty interesting. We got an upper level low and some boundaries attached to it. So that upper level low is going to be back up here towards the north into parts of Canada and then swooping down to the south and then back up to the northwest is where that boundary is going to be located. So it's no surprise that uh, we're going to have some isolated, possibly severe thunderstorms uh, along this area as we go into our Friday. Now on Saturday, as that upper level low moves to the east, so will the potential uh, for some isolated thunderstorms as well. Now we're staying away from uh, several severe storms, uh, meaning the ingredients are there, but it's going to be rather widespread. And you can see the area is very widespread as well. Uh, it is worth noting being upper level low that is going to be stacked to the surface. Not only are you going to get uh, some thunderstorms, but strong winds as well over a larger area not associated with thunderstorms. So again, there's a severe weather risk for your Saturday. And an up close look at wheat harvest in Kansas. Uh, Mark is sharing this video. It is uh, 100 bushel per acre of wheat in central Kansas. Wow, looks like an awesome crop. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Deer and company stock rising on Thursday after the company reported better than expected earnings for the third quarter. The ag equipment manufacturer reporting earnings per share of 629 from equipment sales of $11.4 billion. But despite those positives, 
Deere's earnings and sales have declined compared to the previous year. It reported a drop of 17% in net sales and revenues and a 42% decline in net income over the third quarter of last year. Precision ag sales are down 25% from a year ago. For all of 2024, Deere is forecasting large ag sales in the U.S. and Canada to be down 15%. Higher interest rates are one reason farmers say they haven't been buying as much new ag equipment. And now a better than expected inflation report is fueling hopes the Federal Reserve will finally cut interest rates. As we told you yesterday, the Consumer Price Index, a key barometer of inflation, rose just 2.9% for the 12 months ending in July. That's the first time prices have gone up less than 3% in more than three years. But maybe the most important news for consumers, prices for groceries continue to grow at a slower rate. You've got flat prices at the grocery store. Restaurants, you still see a little bit higher levels of inflation, but again, everything coming down. According to USDA, from 2019 to 2023, the All Food Consumer Price Index rose by 25%. Now, analysts believe the Federal Reserve could start cutting interest rates next month. But as farmers know, it's not just higher interest rates impacting their bottom lines right now. Declining farm income, lower crop prices, and higher production costs also factor in. And those issues are showing up in a new look at the credit conditions from the 10th Federal Reserve District. It shows ag credit conditions tightened in the second quarter of this year, especially in states like Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska, while cattle prices provide some support. Economists report farm borrower liquidity declined and loan demand increased sharply. Repayment rates also fell, which indicate growing financial pressure on producers. Rural bankers are showing their concern about the ag economy, according to the latest Rural Main Street Index. The survey from Dr. Ernie Goss of Creighton University says the August index fell to 40.9 from 41.3 in July. That's the lowest reading since November of last year. In the 12th straight month, the index has trended below growth neutral. Goss says weak agricultural prices, sinking agriculture, equipment sales, and declining farm exports are driving the economy lower, adding that farm loan delinquency rates over the past six months have ticked up ever so slightly. The survey also showing farmland prices falling for the third time in the past four months. Well, it was a mixed day for commodity markets. The Dow saw some triple-digit gains. We'll talk about how those two markets are working together coming up next. And later, we're back to the Golden State, where grape growers are facing serious demand issues and import pressure this harvest season in the country. nation's largest retailer and a market bellwether releasing strong quarterly earnings, Walmart reporting another quarter of strong sales that topped almost all expectations. Now it said store sales were up 4.2% last quarter, digital sales were up a whopping 22%. More than half of Walmart sales come from groceries. It also raised its full year outlook. Walmart executives said the consumer may still be holding out for deals, but they're not seeing signs that their customers are fraying either. Corn pulled back on Thursday while soybeans continue to make some gains, and the stock market continued to move higher following its recent sell-off. Agday's Michelle Rook has more on whether that will help push money into the grain markets in Markets Now. Joining us with market analysis, Darren Newsom with Bar Chart. And Darren, let's talk a little bit about, you know, we've seen an exodus or some long liquidation out of the stock market. Do you expect that that's going to start influencing what the funds are buying in other sectors like the ad markets? I think I think it could. Uh, you know, number one, it, it it creates a deal, a great deal of uncertainty in markets in general. And so this could lead to some short covering just from the idea, number one, they may have to they may have to pay margins for some of the stocks that they that they haven't liquidated too. just not really knowing what the future holds for the, you know, the market landscape in general. Now, on the other hand, it could also drive money over into other investment sectors where fundamentals are bullish. And, and the one that jumps out at me is energies. You know, we continue to see strong inverses, backwardations in the future spreads. They also go after things they seem to think are too cheap or are of a value, right? Right. They, they, they do look at, uh, you know, they, they can look at markets that look undervalued. Uh, this is kind of a filter that we can use along with seasonality 
as to you know where investment money might move, where we might you know put investment money as well. Uh, and so you know certainly December corn or the corn market in general, the soybean market in general, wheat certainly fit that bill. But the problem there is if you compare them to the energy sector, they just don't have the fundamental backing. They just don't have the fundamental reason uh, to draw investment money in. They look undervalued. That just doesn't mean that we're going to see a great deal of buying, maybe short covering, but not necessarily establishing long term. But Darren, even if they got out of all of their short positions, would you see much of a rally? We could see a bit of a rally because then that creates a, a vacuum situation. Uh, if, if we see funds starting to cover and there's no one really looking to sell on top, you know, they're going to say, oh, I'm going to wait 30, 40, 50 cents in corn, whatever, and soybeans and so on. Then you get this vacuum develop. And even, again, fundamentals don't necessarily have to change. And you get a short term pop in the market. But as hedgers, then you're going to want to use that to, to make some of these sales and not suddenly say, oh, look, the markets have changed. I can hold on long term and I can make sales down the road. You're going to have to use it. And you're going to have to be quick about it. Good point. Thanks for joining us, Darren Newsom with Bar Chart. We'll have a right day coming up. Watch Markets Now with Michelle Rook on the Farm Journal YouTube channel, keeping you updated throughout the day on the markets at the open midday and close. Find out what moved the markets today and what to expect the market to do next. I want to quickly revisit what's going on with the latest drought monitor uh, where we had that tropical system come through on the east coast obviously very little in the way of a drought in fact we're not even seeing much in the dry category through north south carolina georgia or even florida come back here over towards the midwest a few pockets where it is dry and uh, thinking with that low pressure system that upper level low that we've been talking about the last couple of days that should alleviate to any of the uh, the yellow that you're seeing here now with the dry conditions uh, that would be updated next Thursday in this drought monitor. Otherwise, still looking at uh, severe, if not extreme, into parts of Montana, the Northwest getting some help, but still in a drought in those locations. And now what we, that means going forward, is we're going to continue to see some rain come down into parts of West Virginia, Ohio, as well as Virginia. Uh, I don't think it's going to be enough uh, to completely alleviate the drought, but I, I should see we should see an improvement over West Virginia, Ohio and Virginia in the drought monitor next week. And jet stream is going to look something like this. The upper level low uh, is showing up in the jet stream and that big ridge of high pressure down here to the south. So you have this severe weather potential kind of in between uh, the trough and the high as we go into Saturday and Sunday, you can see how that uh, severe weather risk shifts more to the east as well as we match up and kind of the right side of the circle here with the right side of the ridge of high pressure down here. And that's where you start to see it's called Typhoons in the jet stream uh, creating the potential for a few stronger thunderstorms. Again, that's Saturday. Uh, by Sunday, uh, we get this amplitude, high amplitude ridge developing by Monday and Tuesday, uh, which is going to really push that heat in and across parts of the United States, including uh, the Midwest as we get into Wednesday and Thursday of next week. Let's go take a look at North Dakota. You got some morning showers high around 77 degrees. Uh, Glenwood, Iowa, sunny, high of 88, low of 63. And Texas, Camp Swift, not Camp Taylor Swift. Just the regular Swift. Partly cloudy, high around 99. New sensors could help farmers save money on irrigation costs. We'll have details next. And later, the cost of growing grapes is hard to recover if there's no demand for the fruit. We'll continue our look at the issues facing farmers in the Golden State in the country. Lots of new technology to tell you about today to help farmers battle the elements. The first Michigan State University researchers have developed what they say is a low cost irrigation monitoring system. It's called Locomos. It's an in-field sensor that measures soil moisture, leaf wetness and other environmental conditions. The information it collects is analyzed by software that generates irrigation recommendations. It then delivers it to growers using an app on their phones. The system has already been tested on multiple field crops, blueberries and potatoes. One researcher says the system boosted profits for a 100 acre field by more than $7,000 and about $1,300 for soybeans each year through improved yields and reduced energy costs. 
The next step in the research is automation, particularly for irrigation. And Cargill is also working on improving irrigation efficiency. It's partnering with Australian company Goanna Ag on a new pilot project. It's taking place in the cotton fields in the Mississippi Delta. Goanna Ag uses field sensors, satellite imagery, weather forecasts, and crop information in order to create precise irrigation. Cargill says the project aligns with its plan to restore 600 billion liters of water and cut 5,000 metric tons of water pollutants in water-stressed areas by the year 2030. And Case IH is announcing some new tech offerings of its own. It says for model year 2025, Soil Command will be factory fitted on select Case IH tillage equipment. It will also work on any ISO-compatible tractor. With it, you can manage depth, track corrections and lift to full transport height, cutting the time lost making manual tillage adjustments. It's also launching Case IH Active Implement Guidance, giving farmers a plug and play system to correct implement drift during planting, tillage and side dressing. Now we know farming for efficiency is the name of the game. That's also true for grape growers in California as they face intense pricing pressure at home and abroad. Continuing our look at the troubles right now for family farms in California wine country, it's not just a decline in demand impacting growers, but as Farm Journal's Tyne Morgan reports, one grower says there's a dirty secret when it comes to imports. Wine grape growers across California are faced with waning demand, and it's something that came to a head during last year's harvest. A lot of our, our growers in the Lodi area operate on what are called long-term contracts. And, you know, many of the large wine companies were using every kind of loophole in the contracts to get out of purchasing grapes and using quality parameters and things like that that, that um, really put pressure on the growers. He says estimates show 400,000 tons of grapes went unharvested last year in California and there are fresh fears this year could be even worse. One of the real frustrating things for the, um, the, the growers in California is that our largest buyers and, and the top seven wineries control about 70% of the U.S. wine market. And, um, you know, over the last 20 years, they've evolved into kind of what we call global alcohol companies. And so they're no longer just sourcing California grapes and just selling wine. As imports increase, Spencer says it's being called a dirty secret in the wine industry. It's even worse than that. You know, I've been digging into this for the past six months and, and you know, there is a, a loophole in our trade regulations and, and it's called uh, double duty drawback, which allows these imports to come in basically tax free. And so they're not, they're basically getting 99% of their alcohol taxes and duties refunded to them if they can provide matching exports. And so that's a handful of companies getting, you know, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars, which has created a significant incentive for this bulk wine imports to take place, which has undercut the, the California grape grower. As imports increase, it's another challenge for California's grape growers who have no home for some of their grapes and the prices they're being paid haven't gone up as much as costs to produce a ton of grapes. We were being paid $2,000 to $2,500 a ton back in 1998. Maybe in current times, in 2023, 2024, for sparkling wine grapes, we're being paid $2,850 to $2,900. And that's really only a 10% increase over 20 years or more. Thompson says at the same time, her costs are up anywhere from 30 to 50 percent. Still, the toil Thompson has dedicated to this land is five generations deep, and she hopes there's still a group of consumers that want a connection to the wine they drink. I really do feel that there is a group out there that are mill millennials who are really getting into collecting wine, um, or they have that authentic need to connect. There's an opportunity in the industry, and I think that the smart wineries will capitalize on that. The question will be for us as family farmers, how long can we wait for them to discover this? And so I just would ask for people in the Midwest or wherever you might be across the United States, like, 
when we say get to know your farmer, we really mean even in the wine industry, know who the farmer is behind those grapes and know who the winemaker is. Reporting for Ag Day, I'm Tyne Morgan. All right, thanks Tyne, and that's all the time we have this morning. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Quinn Griffiths. Have a great day on the Farm Country.